I have a super duper long video for you today because I'm going to show the start to finish process for my strawberry lemonade macarons, which include three different elements, a strawberry lemon curd, a strawberry lemon buttercream, and of course the macaron shells. I am going to start off with the strawberry lemon curd because I want to get this cooling so it can set up in the refrigerator while I make the other things. So first off in kind of a medium sized bowl, and this is gonna go onto a double boiler. So you wanna make sure that it is a good bowl both for a saucepan that you have to fit on top of that it's you know heat proof it will fit on the saucepan all of that so first i'm just zesting one entire lemon in there i like to have a ton of zest for flavor you can strain this out later if that texture bothers you but i think it's a really really important for the freshness um, and to get that really vibrant citrusy flavor. Next, I am going to strain in the lemon juice just because of the number of seeds that you find in any given lemon. It is super important to use a strainer while you can, again, like I mentioned with the zest, strain this mixture after it's cooked. I think it makes a little bit more sense, even if you strain it again later, to just go ahead and get rid of those seeds right away so they're not part of the process. You could use store-bought lemon juice if you're wondering about that. However, I find that the store-bought pre-squeezed lemon juice tends to lack a little bit of that freshness. I am also going to add in some of my own homemade strawberry puree. I just took some frozen strawberries. I put a tiny bit of sugar over the top of them and left them to macerate overnight in my refrigerator. You can use just purely strawberries, um, or if you have strawberry puree that you bought, you can use that as well. I just blended it up and gave that a little strain. Um, you can leave it in if you're not so worried about any tiny seeds, whichever way you prefer is fine. And then I'm going to add that strawberry puree into the lemon juice and lemon zest. Next up, I'm going to add in some egg yolks. This is one of the many great ways to repurpose those egg yolks that come from making so many macaron shells and having a lot of <laughs> yolks from the whites that you're using for the shells. I always like to find ways like this that I can use them. So I always like to have some kind of curd in my macarons and then also to put on things like scones and toast and whatever for breakfast. After the egg yolks go in, I'm adding in some regular granulated sugar and I'm going to give this a really nice stir. As you can see right now, this mixture is a little bit kind of gloopy looking and um, you can see the grains of sugar. If you were to feel that, touch it with your fingers, you it would feel a little bit sandy and gooey so first i'm going to get the pot of water to a simmer while i stir this you do not have to stir this continuously that's why we're doing it in a double boiler so you can kind of forget about it for a while and i'm just going to cook it until it reaches about 82 degrees celsius As I give this a stir, I will continue to check the temperature, though the final stage that it will reach, and you'll kind of see this as I continue to whisk in the beginning, you can definitely feel that kind of egg yolk texture. It is kind of thick, and then as the sugar melts and dissolves, it will get a bit runnier, then it will start to look very frothy, then it will start looking thick again. Um, and this time it will really start to look more like a curd and it, you can do the test where you dip a spoon in and drag your finger down the back and you should be able to have that track mark stay as it is. Um, so you can always do that test, though I think with things like this, it's always a bit safer to have a thermometer handy just to make sure that you've cooked the egg yolks well enough um, because this is the only time that they're going to be heated and cooked through.
as I mentioned, you do not need to constantly whisk. Just make sure that every couple of minutes you're giving it a check, giving it a really good stir. Uh, my thermometer died, so I can't show you the very end what temperature it was. But after I've reached that temperature, I like to take it off the heat and then just leave it to sit. As you can see, it's steaming quite intensely right now. So I like to wait just a couple minutes before using an immersion blender to blend in that butter. Um, it's fine to do it right away, but I just think texture wise, I tend to prefer it if I give it five, 10 minutes to just sit on my counter, cool down a little bit, and then blend in the butter. If you are wondering if you don't have an immersion blender, yes, you can whisk this in. I don't prefer it. I think the texture is much smoother and much nicer if you have an immersion blender. While well, that is in the refrigerator, cooling and setting up, I'm going to move on to the macaron shells. I have my piping tip, piping bag, I have two different colors, a dusky rose and some burgundy. Um, because I had the colors I wanted in two different brands, I'm using that, but it doesn't really matter which brands or even really which colors. I was kind of going for more of a strawberry vibe and then later I'm gonna paint on a little bit of like a golden yellow um, stripe across the top. So if you want to do a like yellow and pink swirl for the strawberry and lemon or add some yellow or gold sprinkles to the top, I think there are a lot of other ways that you could show that this is strawberry lemonade. All right, moving on to the meringue for the macaron. I am using the French method, which I most often do in my home kitchen. I think it is really, really nice for small batches, but you obviously can use whatever method suits you, whether that is Italian, Swiss, whatever. And I really like to start low and slow. That's probably on I don't know, two or three on my KitchenAid. And once I start to see that it's looking white and frothy, I'm going to start streaming in the sugar mixed with cream of tartar. Now that is about a minute. I honestly, I do not time how long this takes. I do get a lot of questions um, in my comments down below and in my messages on Instagram, but I usually work the speed on my KitchenAid by feel. I don't look at it and I just go by appearance when I am using my meringue. I do not use a timer and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I think there are a lot of conditions that could lead you to not wanting to do the exact same thing every single time. And for example, sometimes I make a batch size like this. I'm using 100 grams of egg whites here, but I make a lot of test recipes where I use 75 grams of egg whites. When I'm selling max, I might use 200, 250, 300 grams of egg whites. And so all of those different amounts and recipes and everything, they're going to take a different amount of time even the brand of egg whites, how long they've been sitting out, how warm your kitchen is, it might mean that it's gonna take longer. So I think using a really, really strict pattern with macarons isn't necessarily the greatest idea. It might be nice to start off by saying, okay, I think this should take about 15 minutes or whatever. But I think being really rigid in the long run is not something that will help you out when you're making macarons. Uh, macarons really want you to be as flexible as possible and I think adjust <laughs> as you need to adjust. As I'm adding in the sugar and cream of tartar, I'm going to slowly increase the speed a little bit, maybe more closer to a medium speed, like maybe speed four. And then after all the sugar is incorporated, I oftentimes will increase the speed one last time, maybe to like a five or a six. Macarons, no matter what recipe, whose recipe, what style of meringue you are using. You really never want to crank it up to high speed. You never want to be going on the highest speed. That is going to introduce a ton of air bubbles and that is going to really hurt both the texture and the appearance of your macarons later on. 
what I am aiming for here is a stiff peak for my meringue and that is something that I don't want to achieve while I'm still including the sugar. So I want to introduce the sugar into the meringue within the first half of whipping it. By the time I've hit a medium peak, I for sure want all of the sugar to be incorporated. So as you can see here, as it's mixing, I'm starting to see those tracks forming. I really want to be getting all my sugar incorporated. And then once you've hit like a medium, medium to stiff peak, that's when you really want to get your colorant added to make sure it can really be worked throughout all of the meringue before you reach a stiff peak, before you want to start adding in your dry ingredients. Another thing that I have been getting a lot of questions about recently that I don't think I will ever have the answer for is how many drops, how many grams of food colorant did you use to get this exact color? Um, maybe if I open a store someday and I have somebody else making macarons for me, I will weigh this out and I will properly measure it so someone else can make my vision of macarons. I, unless, um, if you watched my what happens if I add too much food colorant video, I did weigh that so I could explain what is too much food colorant, but otherwise I never ever weigh or measure in any form my colorant. That is something I eyeball and honestly I... I don't see any problem with weighing it out. I think that's totally fine and wonderful, but it's not my jam. I I go by what looks right in the moment to me, so I am so sorry. That's also something you won't find in my videos. I'm going to keep whisking this again on that kind of medium to slightly medium high speed, um, and then once I achieve that really stiff peak, I'm going to stop and transfer all the meringue to a larger, wider bowl.
I really prefer a wider, larger bowl, even with a tiny batch of macarons like this one. When I'm incorporating my dry ingredients, the almond flour and the powdered sugar, I think it makes it a lot easier to see everything and also to fold everything together and then do the macronage process. It's not that you cannot achieve this in a smaller bowl. You, it's not that you can't do this in your KitchenAid or even people who like to use the paddle attachment to add in their dry ingredients. All those things are totally fine. But for me, I've found that this works best. I think that that is something to keep in mind with macarons. No matter how many tutorials you see and how many people give you advice, you really need to find what works for you and in whatever kitchen you are currently in. For me, I have found that baking in different kitchens can lead me to slightly different um, styles. Uh, if you have watched any of my older videos last fall, I was in Portland for several months. This past spring, I was in France for several months. And baking in those different places, I did slightly different things. I used different bake times. I rested my macarons for different amounts of time. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you are experiencing failed macarons or you feel like this advice is not the advice for you sometimes, that is totally okay. I feel absolutely 100% okay with taking none of my macaron advice but if you are feeling a little lost, I hope that this is helpful for you. So I'm incorporating my dry ingredients in about three additions just to make sure I don't have pockets of anything or that I don't accidentally overmix right away. And then once I get that incorporated, I'm going to macronage a little bit more thoughtfully. I'm going to use my spatula to scrape around the edges of my bowl fold the batter through the rest of my macaron batter kind of onto itself purposefully deflating the air um all throughout the batter you don't want to be just focusing on one tiny amount which is why it's so important to fold through the center and then again continuously be scraping up the sides and the bottom of your bowl otherwise you might end up with a bit of perfectly macronage batter and then a bit of kind of macronage batter what I'm looking for here is that ribbon stage when the batter flows like a ribbon from my spatula and back down into my bowl. I've now transferred that macaron batter to my piping bag fitted with the 804 piping tip. You can use whatever piping tip suits you. I have a template and a sill pad. I find that this is what works best for me, though you can certainly do whatever works for you in your kitchen. I am going to pipe straight down. I want to have a 90 degree angle with my piping bag and then the sill pad on top of my counter there. And I'm using a swirling motion as well as stopping the pressure from my wrist and arm to make sure I get a really flat and smooth surface on top of the macarons even before I tap my trays. After I get this entire tray piped, I'm going to transfer this sill pad to the top of a baking tray. I will lightly tap underneath with my hand to smooth out the tops even more and release any large air bubbles. And then I'm going to transfer it back to my counter to let it rest for about 20 to 30 minutes until a skin forms and I put them into the oven to bake. I like to bake my macarons in this kitchen for about mm, 16 to 18 minutes at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, as I mentioned in different kitchens with different ovens, I did things very differently. So you might need to bake them less or much longer or rest them less or rest them longer. Just do a little bit of trial and error and see what works for you.
as these are coming out of the oven i just want to show you one of them i've done a lot of macaron fails videos recently but you can see here what a really good macaron looks like the top should be strong it should peel off the sill pad easily the bottom should be shiny you should be able to put a slight indent in the bottom with your thumb but you should not be able to stick it through the entire macaron with a little bit more force you should be able to tear the macaron apart and these macarons have a little bit of a gap right at the very top there to me that is not a concern that is quite small it is still a really meaty shell and once these mature that is going to disappear the top is not fragile or breakable or thin or anything like that so to me that macaron is perfect the last thing before i can fill these macarons is making the buttercream today i'm going to go with a swiss meringue buttercream so this is also going to require about a medium-sized bowl that i will be putting on a double boiler i've got egg whites i've got sugar i've got vanilla paste all going in here and i'm gonna give this a really good stir with my whisk before putting it over a saucepan full of simmering water similarly with the curd we made earlier this is gonna look kind of gloopy and thick with the if you put your fingers in there you would feel all the granules of sugar but as this heats up and i'm going to cook it over the double boiler until it gets hot um the sugar will completely dissolve and by the time we're ready to use it it's going to look really thin like this it will start looking a bit frothy if you move your whisk through it and if you touch it with your fingers you should not be able to feel any grains of sugar at all once you have reached that point you can take it off the heat um, because there's probably some accumulated water hanging onto the bottom of your bowl make sure to be careful so you don't burn yourself and then i'm going to transfer that over to my kitchen aid bowl obviously you can use whatever mixer you have a hand mixer is totally fine for this as well after I get that transferred in, I'm going to whip it on kind of a medium high speed. It will be very hot and steamy in the beginning, but quite quickly it will cool off and a really lovely meringue will form. I am going to wait until this is meringue gets to be just above room temperature when it's warm but not hot and it's looking pretty thick and glossy if i added the butter in right now it would melt and that beautiful meringue structure would never be able to form it would be quite disappointing so it's really important uh for the texture to wait until this has cooled off wait until that meringue structure has formed before adding in the butter
once it is just above room temperature you have a really nice meringue going start adding in a bit of butter at a time and you really 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 want to make sure that this butter is room temperature basically unless a baking recipe tells you to have cold butter which is usually just for making pie crust or something similar um you want to have room temperature butter uh it is and when we're talking about room temperature it's not like i took it out of my fridge 10 minutes ago it's like it is soft and you can squish it with your fingers but it's not melted so that is going to be super important because it will incorporate much more smoothly if you try to add cold butter into this mix it's going to seize up a bit it will likely end up looking curdled or broken and yes you can bring it back and resolve those issues but it's going to take longer so it is much easier if you just start off with room temperature butter put it in there a little bit at a time and continue to whisk on i like to do about a medium speed uh, just continuously adding it a little bit of butter until everything is included in the buttercream and then i like to continue whisking for i don't know two to five more minutes just to make sure that everything is super incorporated and fluffy. After achieving the texture of buttercream that you are looking for, that is when it's time to start adding in additional flavors. So for the strawberry lemonade buttercream, I am adding in some freshly grated lemon zest. You could add in um, some lemon oil or lemon extract if you wanted to. And then I have some freeze dried strawberries that are powdered. If you want to strain those, you absolutely can. The little tiny seeds don't bother me so i usually just leave them in um, and then i'm just going to again whip that for a minute or two to make sure it's completely incorporated depending on how much of the freeze-dried strawberries you use you might get a really intense pink flavor or it might be a little bit more pale pink like this i did not want the strawberry to be too overwhelming which is why it looks a little bit pale there all right, the last little detail I'm going to add, I have some yellow, kind of a golden yellow um, powdered color and then the gold sparkly luster dust, a little bit of an extract or vodka or gin or something. And then I just, I'm going to paint one stripe across the macaron shells. I really wanted to do this again. Like I said, I have the kind of strawberry for the shell and then this sort of lemonade <laughs> look here with the stripe and there are so many different ways to change or adapt the shell appearance so that the customer would know that you are serving them uh, they are eating a strawberry lemonade macaron whether you want to use sprinkles or swirls or different techniques um, but I really really like to paint on my macarons even just one stripe like this I think it's a ton of fun it is a super easy decoration and I really liked adding in a little bit of 
yellow. Usually I just do a straight up gold, but I really liked how this looked. All right, now that I've got everything ready to go here, the strawberry lemonade buttercream, the strawberry lemonade curd, and then also the macaron shells, I am just going to finish these off, pipe everything together. As you can see, the curd is quite thick, but I still want to create a ring of buttercream so that the curd stays solidly on the inside. I find that I never really have problems with macarons becoming too moist from things like curd or jam but i know it freaks some people out and if you have a looser curd or a looser jam i could see why that might make you a little bit nervous if that is something that makes you super super nervous there are two things that you could do either you could spread a little bit of buttercream to create a barrier on each of the shells uh, so it's not touching the shell at all or another option is to use white chocolate to do the same thing again just brush a tiny bit on to create this like little moisture barrier all right, these need to head into the refrigerator or freezer for at least 24 hours before jumping into them and then they will be ready to eat. And I promise these are super delicious, a really nice, especially summer flavor macaron. But honestly, I would eat these year round because they are incredible. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was so long, but because I've had a lot of requests for showing a little bit more in depth things like how long does it take to whip a meringue and what is the process for buttercream and all of those things, I really hope that those of you who want that kind of content could find it here. Um, if you enjoyed this style, let me know in the comments what other flavors you would like to see filmed this way. All right. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I'll see you next time.